Ahoy! Hello! Welcome along. It's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. You've managed to find the smartest show in the history of sound waves. My name's Dan. This is where we look around the universe to try and search out all those science secrets that are lurking somewhere. We will hunt them for you. This week we'll chat to an astronomer, that's a proper space expert from NASA, all about what other beings might live across the universe. Maybe aliens are in possession of powerful lasers. And if they were able to uh, blink that laser on and off really quickly, they could actually outshine their own star. And we'll travel back in time to the age of the dinosaurs to see what beasts lurked under the water. And teleosts. Bony fish not so different to the cod you get in the chip shop. Uh Uh-oh, that looks like a shark to me. And I've got your questions to answer as always this week. They are on running on water and why planets are round. It's a mind-blowing question. I've never thought of it. Can't wait to figure out the answer. It's all on the way on this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's kick things off for you with this week's science in the news. A pet stick insect has surprised everyone by being half male and half female. That means it's a gynandromorph. Now, Charlie, the stick insect, showed its true colours after it shed its skin to reveal the bright green body of a female and the brown wings of a male. And experts have said that it's the first reported gynandromorph in the stick insect species. Also, a part of a rocket is set to crash into the moon in March. Astronomers think it's probably part of a Chinese rocket that launched back in 2014. Now, the impact of the crash will be small, they say, but still, this is unseen before. Going to be incredible to see what happens. Uh, And finally, the James Webb Space Telescope. That's the big thing in space that launched on Christmas Day. It's looking at the oldest stars around. It's starting to focus. It's unfurled the huge mirror that it's got to protect light. It's the size of a football pitch. And it's taken a picture of one star 18 times. And experts are using that star to refocus the image. And when it sees that star just once, it means the mirror is ready to go. Everything is in focus and it will start work. Time to travel back millions of years now with an episode of our Age of the Dinosaurs series. We're back in the Cretaceous period this week, where more different types of animals and plants lived together than ever before. And things were pretty busy underwater too. Imagine going back in time, not 100 years or 1,000 years, but millions of years. To the age of the dinosaur. Welcome to the Cretaceous period, which existed between 65 and 144 million years ago. More varieties of animals and plants lived than ever before. From the dinosaur on the land to the plants they ate, things were getting pretty busy underwater too. Dinosaurs didn't go into the oceans, but that didn't mean they were empty. Far from it. Much of the sea life from the Jurassic period remained, including ichthyosaurus, agile dolphin-like creatures, as well as starfish and ammonites soft shellfish with long streaming tentacles. Wow, he's massive. Let's get out of this way. He certainly is. Some Cretaceous ammonites were enormous, as much as two meters in diameter and much bigger than their Jurassic relatives. Along with these older creatures, new types of fish were appearing. The ancestors of those we find in our seas today These included rays, flatfish with wing-like fins, and teleosts. Bony fish not so different to the cod you get in the chip shop. Uh Uh-oh, that looks like a shark to me. The wide variety of life made the oceans an attractive place for predators. Sharks, like those seen today, battled alongside much larger plesiosaurs, powerful reptiles with large flippers and a long neck. But towards the end of the Cretaceous period, a terrifying predator ruled, the Mosasaur. Here comes one now. 
Let's get out of here. He's way scarier than a shark. Mosasaurs look like streamlined lizards. Their short paddle-like limbs and powerful tails were ideal for fast swimming, enabling them to pounce underwater at prey. Smaller specimens crunched on sea urchins and mollusks, while the largest varieties, some 17 meters long, preyed on birds, fish and reptiles, and even other mosasaurs. Mosasaurs had a double-hinged jaw and flexible skull, much like a snake, which meant they could almost gulp down their prey whole. Again, just like snakes or Komodo dragons. Paleontology, pick. How do we know what the world looked like millions of years ago? Scientists piece together evidence from fossils using lots of different techniques, including microscopes to look at tiny details and CT scanners to peer inside. They record information about where a fossil was found, examine its surroundings, look at what animals ate, and compare fossils to similar animals alive today, like comparing the mosasaurs to snakes. Computers are used to take this data and create models, from simple black and white pictures to exciting moving animated monsters. Let's answer some of your questions then. If there's something sciencey that you want answered on this show, leave it as a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. There's a little comment box. That's where you drop your review. Let me know your name so I can say hello and give us five stars, which will really help me see it. First up this week, it's from Quentin in Manchester with one of the best questions we've ever heard on the show. Actually, they're both brilliantly phenomenal this week. First up, how fast do you need to travel to run on water? Now, it can be done. This is all to do with physics, the part of science that thinks about forces. The problem with running on water, the force of the water pushing upwards needs to be the same as the weight that's pushing down. Then it would keep you up. Now, there are two ways that that can be done. One is having huge feet that keeps you buoyant which is how a boat stays afloat in the sea when they're really heavy and massive. You can do it like that, or you could run really fast. You see, when you slap your feet down, you get a bounce back from the water. But to put that to use, to use that force, that push-up, you need to be racing. And experts have done the calculations and found that to run on water, you need to be travelling at about 30 metres a second. Now, that's 70 miles an hour which is the speed limit here in the UK. To put that in perspective, Usain Bolt, yeah, the fastest human being ever, he runs at about 10 metres a second. So to run on water, you would need to be three times faster than Usain Bolt. Good luck trying, though. Uh, Also this week, this is from Toby, who is 10. It's another brilliant question. Why are all planets and moons round and spherical? Now, this is because of gravity. Now, gravity is the force that pulls things towards it. And when one mass is much bigger than another, it will pull it towards it, which is why the moon orbits us here on Earth, but why Earth orbits the sun, because it's much bigger. Now, that gravitational force comes from the middle of things. It pulls everything into the middle. And over millions of years, the the force in the planet pulls all the stuff that it's got inside of it, closer and closer and closer to the middle, and that makes it round. Now, with smaller things in space, like like an asteroid, the gravity is too weak to move the mass that's in it. So they don't form spheres, but they keep these strange angular shapes. And that's why planets are round, Toby. Thank you for the question. If there's something you'd like answered on the show next week, leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. Transmission. Now, on Monday, the 21st of February, we are launching Mission Transmission at last. It's our record breaking radio show. It will travel forever through the universe. We're doing it at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich at seven in the evening. And the astronaut Tim Peake is going to help us out. He's going to help us press play and beam this to the aliens. And you can listen to the whole thing live, by the way. Just make sure you're listening to Fun Kids, 7 o'clock, Monday the 21st of February. 
Uh, and this week's special guest is getting us ready for the go. Anne-Marie Cody, who is an astronomer from NASA and the SETI Institute, who are an organisation that search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And she knows so much about the universe and what other things might be out there and how they might find us. And she's been chatting to George from Fun Kids and explaining whether aliens really exist. <laughs> well... We do not know. I wish I had a good answer. And we are looking for aliens. Depends exactly on what you mean by aliens. We don't know of any life outside the solar system um, at this point. Um, but so it's mostly a matter of guesswork and personal opinion. There is no, uh, no scientific discoveries to speak of right now. But we do know of thousands of planets around other stars with NASA's newly launched James Webb Space Telescope. Astronomers are going to be um, trying to study the atmospheric content of those planets and see if the things that sustain life on Earth, like water and oxygen, might exist. But it's a further step to determine if there's some sort of life and if we found something that might indicate like single celled life forms, would you call that an alien? I don't know. What, what would you define as an extraterrestrial? What's an alien? What, how, how do you guys uh, go about defining it? Is that, I don't know if that's a question you, you can even answer. So if you look at the acronym SETI, it's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so it's kind of implied that the aliens that we look for are at least as smart as human beings and possess some sort of technology. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, completely fascinating. I mean, your job is, I mean, it's quite literally like uh, you're in a, you're in a movie. I mean, what you do, I mean, can you just quickly touch upon, I guess what, what you mentioned it briefly, but what SETI does and, and equally what you do at the organization. For example, at the Unifor University of California, Berkeley, um, they are helping to run something called the Breakthrough Listen Project, which is a SETI project, and it has links to the SETI Institute. But in general, when astronomers say we're, in, we're doing SETI, that just means they're searching for extraterrestrials. And they're one of the assumptions that um, we human beings started making back in the 60s is that aliens if they were to communicate or either intentionally or accidentally with us would go with the easiest, cheapest form of signaling, which for us at the time, at least was uh, radio signals because it's very easy for us to generate that. And we even on, on rare occasions have broadcast radio signals off into space. Um, astronomers at the SETI Institute and a few other places have been essentially um, listening to the sky at radio wavelengths with radio telescope dishes, um, which are similar to, you know, a, a little dish you might have at your, on your home to get television or something, but much, um, they tend to be bigger and they just sift through the signals. Um, some of which come from earth-based radios and other transmissions, some of which come from objects in outer space, like stars or galaxies. And these um, astronomers doing radio SETI searches, it's their job to sift through all that and see if there's something that, that appears to be different. It might be coming from some intelligence. And any other signals also uh, would take that long. So if we send a signal to Proxima Centauri and, and want to find out if there's aliens there, it takes four years for them to receive it. And then another four years for them to come to... Uh, talk back to us, which is not really efficient. So we are just listening for signals that may have been sent out in uh, radio SETI. There is also a newer field, and that's the one I work in, called optical SETI, optical wavelengths being the ones you can see uh, with your eyes. And there's a few different ways to do that. One is the assumption that maybe aliens are in possession of powerful lasers. And if they were able to uh, blink that laser on and off really quickly, they could actually outshine their own star on short time scales. So that's one way. And the other way is by actually blocking out part of the starlight. And that's what I have been doing, not blocking out myself, but looking for signs of 
structures that uh, advanced civilizations might build in orbit around their stars. Have you ever come across any potential signs of life out there? <laughs> you know, there have been some um, some exciting finds, which to spoil the story, all turned out to be artificial in nature or, or uh, astrophysical, which means just something caused by the star or a planet. But tell me, Anne-Marie, when you, when you come across these little blips, when you're doing your, your, you know, when you're out there looking for, for signs of, of life and you see something and obviously, you know, you've got to investigate it, but how excited do you get thinking, <laughs> oh my goodness, is, is this, is this the yes. breakthrough? Do you have that or do you just assume that you're, not, it's, you're going to kind of find out it's, it's something different? Yeah. Well, I'm used to this actually from the search for planets, which I've also been involved in. And when you find a, think you found a planet, you have to go through a similar process. I will say the first few times this happens, it is very exciting, very exciting. But when you've done it, like maybe 10 times, you start to kind of feel like, oh, I think think I, this is probably just something boring. I have to investigate it. And it's a little less exciting when you've gone through the excitement 10 times and then had your excitement ruined. <laughs> what would you do if you came across something that you were, uh, you were confident was uh, extraterrestrial activity? Of course, as soon as anyone got wind of this, I think there would be a, a lot of excitement in the media, of course. But my duty as a scientist is to explain everything that I have seen, all the analysis that I performed and to put it in on in writing so that other scientists can evaluate it for themselves. Um, it's hard to say exactly what would happen because we've never found one before, right? Um, so what would, what would the world's reaction be to this? You know, what, what would people think? Would they behave differently if we knew for sure there were aliens out there? Do you really think that we, we genuinely may be able to find extraterrestrial activity in the next, in the next few decades with, with where we are, with, with our innovations and with our technologies on Earth? I think we could potentially find molecular signs of life. Um, whether there's something that could actually communicate with us depends critically on what is out there. And so um, the SETI Institute is uh, home to one of the sort of fathers of uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, Frank Drake. And Frank Drake invented this now well-known equation, the Drake equation, um, which is a way to estimate the possibility that there are advanced and communicating extraterrestrials out there. And it just has a bunch of factors that go in. For example, what is the uh, rate of occurrence of Earth-like planets or habitable planets around other stars? And we're able to put estimates on that now. But the one of the final factors in the Drake equation is how long do intelligent civilizations last typically? And that is the big thing that we do not know. Because if you look at human beings, um, at least in terms of having communication technology, you know, we're looking at like a century or something, which is very short on the time scale of our own, you know, Milky Way galaxy. And then you also look at what are we doing to ourselves and our own planet are we going to warm things up so much that we're going to have trouble surviving in another hundred years? So if we human beings don't make it very long and we die out, maybe something else comes up, who knows, or maybe our planet goes barren, like, you know, and very hot, like the planet Venus, or we don't, we don't see signs of current life on Mars either. Will we go the way of those other planets? So that is the big question. And if we as humans can't figure out how to last very long, then we don't know if other civilizations could do it either. And so if you look at the, um, the lifetime of our own Milky Way galaxy, again, billions of years that the stars have been around in it, um, it might be that life does pop up, but then it dies out quickly. And there's only a few locations around the galaxy that could have life at any given time. 
And so if that's the case, then there might not be anyone out there that can communicate with us right now. It's 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 so interesting. And it's been it's been such a, a pleasure chatting. And uh, who knows, maybe, as you say, in the next few decades, we might come across something uh, quite remarkable. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. It's time for Dangerous Dan, where we look at the most mean and cruel things in the universe. This week, it's all about the Ichneumon wasp. They are a parasite. They're a very common wasp, one of the largest family in the world. They're from all over the place. It's a thick black and brown wasp, long red legs. And at the back, they've got a long, thin, needly thing. It looks like a stinger, but it's not that at all. It's much more terrifying. It's what female wasps use to lay eggs. Only they don't lay these eggs on the ground. Instead, they find another creature. You see, when an innocent insect, like uh, maybe a caterpillar, gets caught, the wasp will lay its eggs inside it. And then the eggs hatch, and the baby wasps eat the body of that caterpillar from the inside out. And when it's a fully grown adult, it'll get free, it'll have destroyed the other insect that it started off life in and it'll start the cycle all over again waiting for another poor caterpillar to wander by thing is this sounds horrendously mean right but they are very useful farmers use these wasp the ichneumon wasps uh, to stop insects damaging the crops they are growing the wasp helps get rid of all the insects they do that using this brutal beast which goes straight onto our dangerous down list It's time to catch up with Professor Halleck now from the Map of Medicine series. He's looking at things that make you unwell and then the experts that make you feel better. This week, Halleck and Nurse Nanabot are looking at what happens in a hospital with an anaesthetist and a surgeon. Professor Halleck's Map of Medicine. Oh no, he's on that blooming game again. Don't knock the game, nurse. It's my marvellous map of medicine. I've invented it to show you loads of medical places you might visit and the medical people who you might meet there. It's going to help us with some seriously sick questions. Hold up. Like this one. Let's open the video phone. Call accepted. Halux's happy health help desk. I keep getting tonsillitis, so I have to have an operation called tonsillectomy. The doctor says I'll be put to sleep. I'm a bit scared. Can you tell me more about what happened? Because when they put my cat to sleep, she came back in a shoebox. That's very sad. Right, first things first. When doctors talk about putting people to sleep for operations, it's totally not the same as what vets do with poorly pets. (coughs) Not the same at all. There's a good dog. Anaesthetists are doctors who are sleep specialists and they're in charge of putting you to sleep for operations. I've got some great facts about them in my map of medicine. But first, let's find out a bit more about tonsillitis. Over to you, nurse, for the clinical crunch. (laughs) Clinical crunch. Whoops. Your tonsils are at the back of your throat. If you open your mouth wide enough, you'll see two fleshy lumps at the back of your throat. (coughs) Tonsillitis is when the tonsils get infected, making them swell up. And that hurts! Sometimes tonsils get so big that it makes it hard to breathe at night. Tonsillitis normally goes away by itself, but sometimes you may need some antibiotics. And if you keep getting it, your doctor might suggest removing them so you can breathe better. This is called a tonsillectomy. Not nice. Thanks, nurse. Tonsillectomies are just one sort of operation that are done while you're fast asleep and the person who puts you to sleep is the anaesthetist at the hospital. Let's check out the map of medicine to find out more about them. Opening the map of medicine. Right, so you're going into hospital and you're going to have an op to sort your tonsils out. You might have to stay in overnight. Bit scary, but better than feeling as rough as rhino's pants. Could have been an elephant there, whatever. So you've got all settled in and it's time for your op. Sorry, that's not helpful, is it? Let me just change that. That's better. You'll meet the anaesthetist before your operation, sometimes on the ward and then in a little room near the operating theatre where he or she will listen to your chest and heart to make sure you're fit for the op. 
they'll put three small white dots on your chest and arms. This isn't because they like playing dot to dot for a laugh. The dots are connected to a machine that monitors your heartbeats and makes a beep 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 sort of noise. Oh, blimey, not like that! Yep, more or less like that. They'll also put a little clip or ring on your finger, which sometimes pinches a bit. Let's just say it's a snug fit. Ouch! Easy on the finger. This is called an oximeter, and it monitors the amount of oxygen in your blood by shining a red light on your skin. Pretty clever for a light. Or oh, what? Now the good bit. The anaesthetist will give you a medicine to make you sleep, either in an injection in your hand or arm, or by you breathing some gas in a mask over your mouth. It's amazing stuff because whilst you're asleep, it stops you feeling anything during the operation. And the anaesthetist's job is to make sure you stay asleep too, so there's no chance of waking up. Being under anaesthetic isn't like being asleep at home. It's really deep sleep. Deeper than that, you can't feel anything when you're under. All right, all right. Gee whiz, sounded like an elephant was doing the snoring there. And whilst you're asleep, the surgeons can remove your tonsils and make sure they won't be bothering you again. When the operation is finished, the anaesthetist will give you another medicine to make you wake up, but you won't remember a thing about what's happened. That's right, and although tonsillectomies can make your throat a little sore for a week or two, the good news is, with no tonsils, no more tonsillitis, ever. Let's have a quick disgusting detail, nurse. There's just time before we go. If you insist. Disgusting detail. In 1846, before anaesthetic was invented, surgery was a terrifying last resort, a final attempt to save life. Some doctors used alcohol and morphine to dull the pain, but patients were wide awake and were often held or strapped down. Nasty! No need for any of that these days. Thanks to those brilliant anaesthetists. Time for us to go, but before you join us again, why not explore Map of Medicine for yourself? Professor Hullock's Map of Medicine is produced by Fun Kids with support from the Wellcome Trust. Thank you so much to Professor Halex and Nurse Nanabot for coming on the show. You can hear loads of episodes from their fantastic series wherever you get your podcasts and over at funkidslive.com. And that's it from us here on the Fun Kids Science Weekly for another week. We've got so many brilliant shows for you on Apple, Google, Spotify and on the free Fun Kids app. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com.